Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Rhett Thompson, a filmmaker and videographer, and today I'm checking out two of the fastest premium prime lenses for the GH5 and Micro Four Third system. And those are the Voigtlander 42.5 f.95 and the Leica 42.5 f1.2. Let's check them out. If you want to skip my brief history lesson, either check the description or the chapter times or skip to this time to start out with the build quality. So, Voigtlander versus Leica, kind of a tale as old as time. Many people became aware of Voigtlander in the first place in the late 1990s as a company who made cheaper alternatives to Leica's own camera lenses. Fast forward to the Micro Four Thirds days and Leica partners up with Panasonic to create some of the Leica branded lenses, which apparently are designed by Leica and manufactured by Panasonic. Voigtlander apparently didn't want to be left out and joined in on the Micro Four Thirds fray to compete once again with their old rival. Why not pit these two against each other and see which one's best? Let's check out the build quality on the 42.5. Generally, it's pretty big for a micro four thirds lens, but it's not nearly as heavy as it looks. So eh, take it for what it is. It's got a really nice aperture ring that clicks every third stop. And if you don't have a Panasonic camera or just want to set it in camera, you can always switch it to auto and you'll be able to control it inside the camera. Below that is the focus by wire ring. Uh, ideally, it would have one of those clutches, but it doesn't. And under that, you can see the autofocus and manual focus switches. This whole thing is based on a metal lens mount, but unfortunately, there is no weather sealing back there or anywhere on the lens, so definitely be careful with this thing and the elements. And at the front here, you can see that awesome front glass element, and this is a 67 millimeter front focal filter, so when it comes to putting filters on here, those are the ones you're gonna to wanna to look out for. The lens hood is really cool too. You just kind of slide it on, tighten this knob here, and it's looking pretty freaking serious. Super good build quality. If it was weather sealed, it would probably be perfect, but it is what it is. The Voigtlander without having all the image stabilization and autofocus parts in it is actually pretty small in comparison, but it's definitely heavier too. If that's aluminum, this feels like it's carved out of lead. I know it's not, but it might as well be. Super solid, really nice manual focus ring. If you're a photographer, you might really appreciate the clicky aperture, but if you're a filmmaker, you can grab these handles and switch it over, and you've got a smooth aperture control. This lens, of course, is built on a metal lens mount, just like the other one. And the whole thing here is metal as well. It's got a really great front element and it's a 58 millimeter filter thread. When it comes to build quality, do I have a preference when it comes to these lenses? Uh, it's really hard for me to argue that the Voigtlander is built like a tank. So I would say the Voigtlander has slightly better build quality, but if the Leica was weather sealed, that might just be the perfect lens. All right, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on image quality here because I know photographers and filmmakers use these lenses. The Voigtlander can open up to an impressive f0.95, but how is the image at that aperture? Well, as I said in the video of the Voigtlander versus the cheaper Miticon, I think there is some sharpness to be had in the middle here, but it's covered up by a kind of haziness and ghosting and some low contrast issues, which isn't to be unexpected at this wide aperture. There is also a color shift putting us more towards a magenta purple wide open here. And the biggest issue for me is purple and green fringing. And that happens at the wider apertures. At f.95, it's pretty extreme on high contrast areas. At f1.2, the Leica more than makes up for that slightly slower aperture 
by having more contrast and sharpness than the Voigt Lander, as well as completely eliminating that purple fringing problem, at least on the subject that's in focus. I know probably 80% of it is software removing it and not lens design, but all I care about really is the final results. Although you can still find evidence of purple and green edges on things that are slightly before and behind the focal plane. But even then, it's pretty minor. The Leica also suffers from the magenta color shift wide open, but it isn't nearly as severe. In fact, I kind of like it on both of these lenses, but it is kind of strange. Stop the Leica down to f2, and you see the contrast and sharpness improve even more. And the colors are much more accurate to life the Voigtlander at f2 might be a little softer than the Leica, but has improved drastically stopped down from f.95 in every regard. The Leica at f4 is about as good as you could ever want, and in the center at least, the Voigtlander might even be slightly better, which is kind of strange. The Leica going from f4 to f8 looks identical, and the Voigtlander at f8 might be ever so slightly softer, diffraction might already be kicking in, eh, hard to say. At f16, the Leica is flat out soft, but it looks like the Voigtlander actually, while still soft, has a little bit more resolution here than you would expect stopped down all the way to f16. The Leica does have that party trick of software correction, so technically, overall, I would say the final results of the Leica are better, but both can obviously perform super well. Oh, and I know I skipped over the f1.4, since it's so close to 1.2 on the Leica, but the Voigtlander does perform really well at f1.4 compared to wide open. So I think they would be closer than you think just going down from f1.2 to f1.4 and f.95 to f1.4. So yeah, crazy roller coaster of a ride when it comes to image quality, but overall, yeah, you can get some really great results with these. Before we move on from image quality totally, let's look at vignetting. Don't click away, come on. I'm gonna keep it quick. Both lenses vignette significantly wide open and both get very good at f2 and furthermore are essentially perfect when they get to f4. That's it, I told you, we're done. So I'm always kind of curious how these fly-by-wire lenses will work in manual focus because I do a lot of video and filmmaking, don't really use autofocus, so that's what we're here testing out. I know the Voigtlander we're going to test in a second is manual focus, so it'll be a good comparison of how a fly-by-wire lens works versus a manual focus lens. So let's give it a shot. Alrighty, we're at f1.2, and we'll just go from like this tree to the background here. So background, oop, tree. So this is looking pretty linear, honestly. I don't see much speed ramping and it's pretty repeatable. Let's go to a little bit of a closer subject, my camera here. And let's see if I can nail it. Yeah, pretty close background. So the focus travel is pretty long here. So this is an entire rotation, so. I couldn't even do it. So if you're gonna be doing like a from very close as minimum focus to like infinity, a one, two, three, four, 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 five uh, turns, just like normal turns to really get that going. But yeah, the motor's pretty linear. It doesn't seem to have much or any speed ramping and it's pretty, pretty great, honestly. Might be my second favorite manual focus that's fly-by-wire that I've used. Pretty good. So next up, we've got the Voigtlander here and we're gonna pit it up and see how a true manual focus works against a fly-by-wire. So let's check it out. Back to our tree here. As good as that fly-by-wire is, nothing can really compare to a true manual focus when it comes to just accuracy, repeatable motions, and having a good feel for the lens. Let's go for a more close-up subject here, our camera again. Yep, it's pretty much great. I mean, Going from the background to the foreground is super easy. Let's see how big of a rotation it is. So that's minimum focus here, and I could pretty easily get to the background in one turn. One, two, so three small turns instead of four or five. 
So it is technically a little bit better. And yeah, it feels great to use. It's, you know, pretty much no question. If you're doing only manual focus, hate autofocus, never do photography, this is gonna be a great choice. But if you do a little photography like ever, you like to pre-focus like autofocus before a shot rolls, then the like is gonna be really helpful for stuff like that just because it's so convenient to have autofocus in those certain situations. So it's pretty much a toss up, but I think for manual focus in a vacuum, no other considerations, the Voigtlander wins for sure. Both lenses display focus breathing for sure more than I would like, but better than I've seen in the past, like with maybe the Rokinon lenses I had before. Um, they're pretty good, but they're not great. What are you gonna do? Nothing ever really matches the frustration I feel when I can't focus close enough to my subject. Luckily, both of these lenses are pretty decent for an 85 millimeter equivalent. The Leica gets us 1.6 feet away from our subjects for a 0.1 magnification ratio, which is quite a bit better than your average 85 millimeter on a full frame DSLR. As decent as that is, the Voigtlander goes all out with a just over nine inch minimum focus distance and a 0.25 magnification ratio, which can get you some super close up shots. Image quality sure does take a hit here and the lens is softer and glowier than ever, but stop down a little like to F2 even and you'll have a sharp enough image up close. I'd rather have it than not. So that's a bonus in my book. Given that these are fast portrait length uh, lenses, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on bokeh here than I otherwise would. Uh, usually it's not that important, but if it ever is important, it would be for a lens like this. So here's a few shots to check out that bokeh. And obviously the Voigtlander here looks super great. When a subject is at the portrait sort of length away from the camera, the subject is super sharp, even wide open, and the bokeh is awesome. There's really no other way to put it. Moving on, the Leica at 1.2 is stunning as well. Sure, the colors are slightly different and there is a little less bokeh, but overall, my first thought is it's kind of striking how similar these two lenses really are. I've even got the two mixed up a few times when I wasn't looking at the metadata. That really surprised me. I was sure the Leica would be markedly sharper or have less purple fringing or eh, whatever, but they are super similar. The biggest differences are really the color and contrast, which can easily be fixed in post. F2 for both lenses is a very similar story, and the two are, if anything, even more indistinguishable than ever. The one extra diaphragm blade of the Voigtlander and the curved nature of the Leica blade seems to be mostly irrelevant in this situation. F4, F8, and F16 are essentially all the same story. If you get a more distant subject like this and you shoot it wide open, you can see a few more differences. The Leica here has very good contrast and the cooler colors like before, but the bokeh here is super smooth and essentially perfect. I can't see a single thing wrong with it. The Voigtlander definitely has some green highlighting in the bokeh around that water here. And the bokeh in general is a little bit more bitty, gritty, and busy. Almost has like a bubble bokeh effect like you'd see in a more vintage lenses. And overall that has the effect of a more painterly image, not unlike a vintage lens in that respect as well. I have to butt in here real quick and just say, this is all relative, of course, because when I compared the Voigtlander to the Mitacon, like we did in the previous video, the Voigtlander looks tame and smooth compared to that lens, where its qualities were busy compared to the Voigtlander. I'm not really sure what the conclusion is gonna be from that thought that we just went through, but uh, it definitely is worth noting that all this stuff is relative and the Voigtlander looks amazing compared to some lenses even though the Leica might beat it in one test here or there. I really find I love the flares from the Leica, and this test really doesn't do them justice. The light source itself isn't too bloomy, but here you do get the classic micro four thirds effect with those purple blotches on the sides and top and bottom of the light source. There is one big green blob and some other soft flaring that is present, but other than that, it's pretty well controlled wide open for such a fast lens. There's also a little flare when the light source is just out of the frame, but 
That should be largely solved with this big lens hood that is included that we talked about in the build quality department. The Voigtlander is a lot more tame than I remember and more tame than you might expect, but certainly is a lot more fun than the Leica is, giving us some really soft red and green and bluish rings and spots. Uh, they're all really soft, so I generally don't find them very uh, intrusive on the image, but they definitely are a little bit more noticeable than the Leica in everyday situations. The Leica stopped down doesn't look that much different other than some soft spikes of light coming from the source now. That edge flare gets a little more wild and the edges of the individual flare elements are a little bit more noticeable. The Voigtlander has an interesting character when stopped down. The light source already has some pretty significant spikes coming out from it, and the specks of flare are generally pretty large still, washing out the image with this big green bluish hue when the light source is inside the frame of your shot. You lose a lot of contrast here, maybe even more than wide open, so uh, I'm not sure what to make of this flare pattern. And it's sun star time again. I'm gonna mostly let you guys make up your own minds like usual, but the Leica has a ton of soft beams of light emitting from the source with a bunch of varying lengths. And the Voigtlander has less, I think, but the lines are very defined and straight. I don't know, like usual, I'll let you guys decide. And you know, I'd actually love to hear from you which one you prefer. So please let me know down in the comments, uh, what do you think, Voigtlander, Leica. So these are both portrait length lenses, so I figured why not shoot some portraits and see how they actually do when photographing people, which is what a lot of people are gonna be doing with these lenses. First up, we got a shot from the Leica and we're seeing pretty much everything we would expect here, except the biggest surprise is probably that glaring glowy flare around the sun. It's pretty extreme. And if you go to the Voigtlander here, you can see it has less of that glare flare, less contrast, but also some like bit reflection flare type deals. Another shot with the Leica showing off that really glowy flare sort of thing. You know, there's not really any flare elements. It's just that glowy glare. And I've got some other portraits that show that later on. Whereas the Voigtlander just has those weird little reflection bits kind of by her shoulder on this picture. So yeah, I mean, both are producing some super awesome images. It's really hard to say which one is better unless you really prefer the color or contrast of one or the other. Here's a more medium distance sort of shot. I'd say the Leica holds up better at these further distances because the background is pushed so much further back. You get that 3D pop effect. And the Voigtlander is good in that department as well, but the background might be ever so slightly distracting. Like look at the road. It's a little bit busy when the background is only slightly out of focus. So here's a couple more shots that I've filmed. This isn't a portrait, of course, but I just wanted to show you how extreme this glare can get. Uh, the flare test really didn't show it off, but that glare can really come into your images when the sun is in or just out of the frame. So definitely use the lens hood if you don't like that, but personally, I kind of dig it. And as you can see, the Leica just is amazing for those sort of medium distance shots. You know, uh, there's just enough focus for everyone to be in focus and the background to still be really out of focus. And in this picture here, you can see the great color, the great bokeh, but also that glare flare coming through with the sun. And yeah, it's definitely a quirk of the Leica, but I kind of like it. And one more picture with the Leica just to show off how good that separation is. I, we weren't that far away from the flowers here. And you know, she really stands out as being the center of attention in this picture. Honestly, the biggest difference from these for photography portrait sort of thing is the autofocus you know uh, every time i'm going to do a portrait session i'm going to be reaching in my bag for the leica just because it's got autofocus because as good as the results might be from the voigtlander if you miss focus because you're using manual focus the rest of the elements of the picture don't really matter Ooh, okay, let's wrap this thing up. And honestly, I think I can make it pretty quick for you guys who wanna get out of here and then elaborate a little more. These lenses are neck and neck in almost every category. There are trading blows with one being sharper at certain apertures and one being able to open up a little bit wider, one having better build quality and the other more pleasant bokeh. 
Unless you skipped right here via chapter markers, I think you all know that and you can make your own decisions on those individual points. So if I had to break this down into just one or two factors that would be a make or break with these lenses for you, what would they be? Well, they're probably two of the most boring things, autofocus and image stabilization. If you do video work where autofocus is occasionally helpful before a shot, and especially if you do photography, the Leica is almost certainly the lens for you. Same if you don't have a camera with in-body image stabilization, the Voigtlander is gonna be really difficult to use unless you're like always on a tripod. If you don't ever use autofocus and have a camera with IBIS or simply don't need any additional camera stabilization for help, and the Voigtlander is an amazing lens for people dedicated to manual focus or filmmakers. That super cool vintage cinematic look and the manual features such as the real manual focus, the clickless aperture ring, I don't know. Those things are gonna be really hard for some filmmakers to pass up when considering these two lenses. So at the end of the day, the electronics of the Leica versus the visceral feeling of the Voigtlander is the number one reason by far to get one of these lenses over the other, in my opinion. And if those are non-factors to you, hopefully one of the other topics I touched on will be of a help. Anyway, guys, legitimately, thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, I assume you liked the video. So if you did, go ahead and hit that like button. While you're down there, I would really appreciate it if you left a comment. Let me know if you liked the video, if you wanna see more lens battles. Also, tell me which one you would get, the Leica, the Voigtlander, or maybe something else. Like also, if you like this video, you wanna see more lens reviews or gear videos, hit the subscribe button and get notified when my new videos go live. Anyway, thank you guys again, and I'll see you in the next one.